Well, Reed Logan Westgate is with us. How are you doing today? I'm great, and yourself? Yeah, I'm doing smashing. Now, you've got your Baku trilogy, of course, and we're going to mainly talk about the first book in that series, but how would you describe the series overall? Uh, overall, it's a classic urban fantasy adventure, mm. uh, really in the vein of like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Supernatural, you know, really honing in on that um, very tough, pro-heroic feminine hero. Yeah. Do you think it's quite important to have a strong female lead? I think for me it was. Mm. Um, I'm writing for my two daughters, mm. so it's important for me to really put that out there for a character that they can identify with. Yeah. And where did the inspiration for this series actually come from in the first place? You know, I had kicked around writing fantasy for a long time, and I just, I felt like everything had been done. Mm. I, I wasn't coming up with any new ideas or anything original um and then the baku from japanese lore and legend just kind of stuck out to me as here's something i could do you know with magic and the city of portland and mm. it just felt right and it just happened it it flowed onto the page yeah absolutely and how long as well did it take you to write the first book took me about a year uh i was recovering from a surgery at the time so i got a good head start yeah. uh but i still was doing the normal nine to five daily commute and whatnot mm. so i mostly write on the weekends yeah and saturday is your writing day isn't it it is yeah it is saturday and sunday are my writing days yeah what is it about saturday that is the best <laughs> i i mean for the most part i'm still doing you know all the dad responsibilities yeah. during the week i'm punching the clock i'm bringing home a paycheck saturday is finally like me time mm. and uh this is my outlet yeah absolutely is it still hard sometimes to find time to write though oh definitely it, it's a huge challenge um because you're balancing family life you know i've got two girls i've got a wife um and sometimes you feel almost guilty because you're taking that time away from them you know yeah are there any maybe peculiar things that you do to help you focus on writing at first i was um writing in my kitchen so <laughs> i had a lot of noise and a lot of distractions so i'd put on my headphones and i'd try to turn on music and drown out the world around me yeah. um now i'm kind of in a rhythmic uh pattern where i sit down um i've got a room dedicated for it now so i just sit down and start listening to music and typing the story yeah now the first book in the series is of course called the infernal games so how would you describe the premise of that book so our main character um is a descendant of lauren legend she has magical abilities um and a demon takes notice of her abilities yeah. and decides to use her as a pawn against another rival demon in the greater Portland area. Um, this leads to a whole web of betrayal and challenges for her to confront. Um, an interesting part of the story and what Infernal Games is really about is human choice, right? Free will. Um, and your perception of what is really good and what is really evil, kind of blurring that line a little bit. Yeah. And some of the names in the book are quite interesting. How do you actually come up with names like that? Because they're names that you probably don't know people with them in real life. <laughs> the name Exlina is actually Greek, meaning from the woods. I was looking for something um, to describe her Druidic origins, right? Yeah. Her father's a Druid. Her mother is Japanese. Um, so I was looking for a nice blending of that um and that's how i landed on that name i kind of worked backwards into something meaning from the forest or from the woods yeah and do you think it's quite important to have a name that actually has a meaning because maybe a lot of people would forget that well i mean for me i wanted my characters to stick out yeah. right part of the um building of that mythical world where you have magic hiding in broad daylight was to give the characters a little bit of a cue and give the reader a cue that that, hey, this person might not be Bob or Jane from down the street. Yeah. And which of the characters do you think was the hardest to create? For me, the hardest character to create was Amber, mm. uh, which is a side character um, that lives down the hallway from the main character. And she's your typical college co-ed, very stereotypical. <laughs> uh, I had originally put her in uh, to be a um, victim that gets killed in the storyline. But then my teen daughter, 
daughter loved the character so much. She was like, dad, you can't kill her. You've got to do something with her. Yeah. Um, so then the pressure was on, right? Like mm. now, now I've got to make this person who is going to be just a throwaway victim, an actual character in the book. Yeah. So have you very much involved your teen daughters in the writing then? Because obviously she knew about the characters before you finished it. Yes. My, my oldest teen is my harshest critic. <laughs> Uh, if you ever want the blunt, honest truth about your work, give it to a teenager, mm. especially your teenager. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's interesting because would you say that teenagers are maybe even more critical than young children? Because teenagers at least have matured to a point where they don't want to offend people still. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, my daughter, Emma, uh, is around 16. She was around 15 at the time that I wrote the first book. And she very much was my voice of hey dad that's not cool mm. that that you know you need to go back and look at this uh she had no problem when i asked for honest criticism really opening up mm. she wasn't worried about offending me which <laughs> was nice because a lot of people that you give it to they're like oh it was nice i liked it yeah and are they very typical of the audience of the book uh my oldest daughter is a huge supernatural fan mm. so she this is right in her wheelhouse this is the type of book she reads it really really appealed to her. Um, so I really trusted that feedback coming back, especially where my main character is a woman. Yeah, it, it was very critical for her to feed that back to me and say, yeah, dad, you nailed it. Yeah, that's kind of important because I guess it's hard as a man to know what is the correct thing to write and how a character would react. Right, right. And I mean, especially when it came to uh, clothing my characters and describing those yeah. scenes, it's like, you know, I, I'm a guy, I have a limited wardrobe, I have t-shirts and jeans. <laughs> Yeah. And every character could look like that. Mm. And my daughter's like, no, 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 no. Here we got to We got to sit down and look at a couple of websites here. And I'm going to give you some <laughs> outfits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the book is quite descriptive at times. There's some quite gruesome stuff that's described in detail. Is that quite hard to envision when you're writing? You know, it's an interesting take, um, you know, because with urban fantasy, there's a lot of really dark content. Mm. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to explore explore when I wrote this series is really, you know, what defines good and evil. And in order to really hold up that candlelight to it, you have to show evil, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it is tough sometimes to write some of those scenes. There are some pretty graphic scenes mm. um, that, you know, I, I don't exactly want to read that to my youngest. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, interesting. <laughs> and where do you get your inspiration for dark scenes like that? Because that's stuff that hopefully you can't get from your own life that is a hundred percent true yeah. i mean a lot of it um especially in book one and book two i started digging down a rabbit hole of research mm. you know i i wanted my demons to feel really de demonic if you will um, which led me down to other great works um, throughout history, uh, Dante's Inferno, stuff like that, where I could really draw some inspiration from. Yeah. And as well, the book sort of challenges our preconceived good and evil, right? That's the uh, Oxybius, our necromancer friend, who ends up being uh, the main character's ally, yeah. is exactly that. He is everything that her parents had ever told her was evil in the world. And yet here you have this character who, you know, is a cannibal mm. first and foremost, and he's using dark magic. Yeah. But deep down when you scratch the surface, he's actually a really good guy, right? Yeah. Um, and there are multiple scenes where you see that where he's almost correcting her morality. Mm. That's interesting because a lot of the time in books, it's perhaps the other way around. We think somebody's good and then there's a massive twist and it turns out they're the bad guy. So it's quite good right. to have it this way around. Yeah, I mean, I've gotten so much feedback. People love that character mm. so much. His dark humor um, and the fact that he doesn't really save her as much as he encourages her to live up to her potential. Yeah, right, for sure. And of course, there's an audio book for this and there's a guy with a pretty cool voice that does it. How did you get him? I had auditions through uh -huh. Audible and he was amazing. Mm. He stuck out. Um, he did so many voices and we listened to him and I was like, that's my guy right there. Yeah. Um, so I sent him an offer and he has been a pleasure to 
work with. And he really does some really awesome voice work. Yeah, and he's not only done this book, he's done other ones of your books as well, right? Yes, he's doing the whole series um, and he's interested in doing the next stuff that I work on. He wow. he and I kind of really jive writing-wise. Yeah. He likes my style, so. Yeah, absolutely. And do you have plans for maybe more books out with this series as well? I do. Um, so when I finish this trilo- trilogy, um, I'm going to go back and tell Oxivius's backstory yeah. in a three book series, the Soul Stealer series, mm. um, because there's so much love for the character. Everybody wants to know, you know, where he came from because yeah. he's very mysterious. Yeah, that's an interesting idea doing a new trilogy, but it's still the same universe. Right, yeah. right. Um, and kind of to fill in those gaps, right? Because you, you see him as a side character, but you never see things from his point of view. Mm. Um, so to go back and fill in those gaps and tell the history. Yeah, this is like Star Wars now, isn't it? Three different trilogies yes. that are kind of <laughs> the same. Um, there are dream eaters in the book. Where did that idea come from? In Japanese lore and legend, the Baku is a mythical creature that comes and visits children mm-hmm. and it consumes the dreams, mostly bad dreams. Mm-hmm. But the flip side of the legend is that if you have no bad dreams to consume, they can actually uh, consume your hopes and desires. Yeah. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, I took that piece of lore and really wrapped it into my character and said, you know, how awful would it be to have this magic, but the price to pay for that magic is the vicious nightmares every night. Yeah, And this is a trilogy, but could you maybe read the books as standalone novels? Yeah, I try not to leave on a cliffhanger that doesn't complete the individual book, because I know as a reader that drives me crazy. (laughs) I don't want to read one story split into three books. Uh, Mm -hmm. So each one of these books is a story unto itself, and it continues through the lives of the main characters. Mm. And I suppose if you wanted to read just one book, you can start with the first one anyway, and then you're not lost. <laughs> that is true. Uh, there's a lot more of the world building done in the first book yeah. than in the second book. Um, but at the same time, I, I try to keep it to that place where I do enough explaining as I go mm. so that you can jump in on the second book and just enjoy the story. Yes, yeah, so that's absolutely true. You sort of get a good idea of what's going on in the book, unlike many others. Yeah. And the third and final book is coming out very soon, I believe, right? That's correct. Uh, so uh, Beyond the Mist, Dark Messiah is the final book in the series. Mm. Um, that comes out on June 1st yeah. uh, of this year. So we're getting really close. I'm really excited for that one to come out and really put the end cap on this story. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds like such a good idea. And do you have a timescale for the spin-off trilogy yet? Or are you just going to wait and see? I'm hoping to have the first book, Soul Stealer Origins, out um, and available in October of this year. Wow. Uh, I've kind of been writing it as I go uh, because I've had all these ideas and plugins for his history and his backstory. Yeah. So now it's just a matter of organizing it into a story Mm. and it's interesting because you want to keep writing more and more books in this series so you're obviously getting a lot of inspiration and care a lot about this universe right yeah i i mean i'm i'm very vested at this point i love the characters i've really enjoyed telling this story and i want to see the world continue Mm. um so i've started really investing in the baku universe if you will and trying to make something that's going to be bigger Yeah. And when you get so much inspiration, is it hard sometimes to give up a certain storyline after three books? It is. I mean, I've grown very fond of my characters um, and it's hard to think about other stories and not have them there. Yeah. Well, where are we able to check out the whole Baku trilogy everywhere? The first and best stop is to stop in at my website, um, rlwestgate.com. And the books are available on Amazon in all markets. Um, So internationally, worldwide, feel free to check it out. Great. Well, many thanks for joining us today. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on.